EntertainmentBuddha.com back to a brand new episode of Star Wars Time. It's Matt and my buddy Nick, and we're here to talk all things Star Wars. Maybe not all things Star Wars today, because we're going to dedicate this entire cast to Solo, a Star Wars Stories home release. All right, so in our last episode, Nick and I, we recorded it on the day that it came out, and, and we'd seen some of the deleted scenes because they were released early. But now we've both gone through all of the behind the scenes content that comes with the home release. And we just kind of wanted to navigate you through it to, to let you know of some of the really great things you're going to see on it, as well as some of the, the dumb things, some of the things you could probably skip. But honestly, if you're a real Star Wars fan, you're going to watch every damn thing on it anyway. So you're probably just going to take whatever we say with a grain of salt. And that's quite all right. Because based on our little uh, life learning session last weekend towards the end of the cast where I was telling you about uh, opinions and how you should try to form your own, uh, clearly you should watch all of them and see what you think of the behind the scenes material. But we're here to let you know what we think because in the end what we think is right. Right, Nick? Yeah. 100% 100% right. I mean, there's an hour, you got about a good hour and 45 minutes of content. Yeah, yeah. Here I mean, the, 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 the featurettes, pure featurettes, I think they, they lump them all together, which is kind of janky. And that, that, that clocks in at 127. Then you got about 15 minutes of deleted scenes. So, yeah, it's a good chunk. And I like how, you know, in previous films, like, you know, with The, with the Last Jedi, there was a very long uh, featurette that was, you know, the the director oh, that, and the that was Jedi a full on. That you, thing was is still a, a yeah, work. Of that was beauty. almost I mean, a that movie. was a full on yeah. legit. That documentary should be up for an Oscar. Yeah, it was fantastically shot and it was fantastically kind of you know not written, but it it really portrays you know Mark Hamill's adventure from going from you know no no part in TFA essentially except the very end to coming into this role and really having to accept who Luke Skywalker is now and working with Ryan Johnson to figure out, you know, where this character has been since we last saw him in any meaningful way in episode six and why he is this way. But with solo, we get shorter kind of, I don't want to say bite size, but you get more digestible features that really give you different looks at different portions of this movie. And it's, it's really cool how they strung them together. And I really enjoyed being able to watch those kind of back to back to back and seeing all these different aspects of not only the filmmaking, but um, you know, what the actors and actresses went through to, to make this movie. It was really, really yeah, cool. I love it. I mean, we, we were talking before we went live about how we both hate ourselves for being fuck ups when we were younger and not realizing that this is where our passion lies. And we're not making movies ourselves of this scope because honestly, I would be happy if I was a fucking key grip or the best boy on on a production like this because whenever you watch these behind the scene things, dude, don't you just feel like everyone is it's like a family atmosphere. You're all working towards a goal. You're creating art. And I know there may be long days, but how in the end you get to sit there and say, yeah, I worked on a Star Wars movie. Yeah, I know. And, you know, how often can somebody say, you know, I'm in the credits of a Star Wars movie or, you know, sit in the theater and watch their name scroll up the screen and say like, hey, I did that on this film or, you know, I was the reason that this scene looks the way it does. I mean, it's it's a it is kind of like a dream industry to work in, especially if you're talking specifically about Star Wars Um, and the the actors and actresses kind of parroted that back during their roundtable session because you kind of you know the way that this was set up is you had ron howard at the head and then you had all of the the main players of the film kind of sitting around this table and talking about their experiences and one of the first questions he asked was like what was your reaction what did you do when when you got that call that said hey you're in a star wars movie and every one of them everyone who answered that question was like you know, I, I screamed like I call I immediately called my mom or I, I told these people like, it well, was, I mean, I, I hate to use this example, but it, it was kind of like 
Pearl Harbor, 9-11, I mean, people alive during those events, you, you, you always remember what you were doing, where you were, the time of day when you found out about this shit. And that, that's how these actors were essentially uh, retelling their stories of finding out. I mean, every one of them knew exactly what they were doing, who they called, what they did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, even um, Donald Glover went into a little story about how the moment that he was announced as Lando, like he's walking down the street to go get pizza and everybody's already calling him Lando. And it, we're, we're talking hours after the announcement came out. So that's how big, you know, that type of announcement was for him. And we all know how big Donald Glover is in Hollywood now, not only Hollywood, but in the music industry. So... I mean, when, when something like that happens to you and you are now, you know, Lando Calrissian in a new Star Wars movie like that, that has a, a massive impact on your life, no matter how big of a star you are. Um, and it was really cool to see people to the caliber of, you know, of even Paul Bettany saying that he begged Ron Howard to be in this movie. Um, it's pretty, pretty. Yeah, cool if, stuff. If, you, if you don't know the story about how Bettany got in the movie, his his role was supposed to be played by, I believe his name's Marsala Ali. Uh, but due yeah. to the, you know, the fuck ups with the directors and the reshoots and yada, 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 he couldn't come back because he was committed to something else. So they needed someone else to play Dryden. And there you go. Bettany I, I apparently called up Howard and said, please put me in. Um, I don't know if they're hamming it up for the round table discussion, but it sounded like uh, he definitely got down on his hands and knees and said, please, 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 please. Which is, I mean, honestly, I look at Paul as more of a a serious actor. I know he's he also has a character in the MCU, but I, I feel like when... I feel like when he's doing those movies, he does it. He feels like he's be, he's one of those actors that feels like his talents are being wasted or something. I'm not trying yeah, to say I he's mean, a pompous asshole, <laughs> but he, I guess like any any British actor always feels like they're they're more serious than like slapsticky American actors. But I like I guess my first memory of Paul Bettany was really from Knight's Tale when he was playing, you know the the I can't remember his name. Um, Je- oh, he's playing Jeffrey Chaucer. Yeah, of course. Um, but that was more, that was kind of like a hybrid serious and, and comedic role. And I really enjoyed, you know, watching him in that. And then, like you said, though, like he goes into the MCU and he plays more of a stoic, serious character in Vision. And then now with this role as, as Dryden. Which, comes dude, Batney's really... been in, in the MCU just as long as RDJ. I mean, yeah, because he yeah, he's, uh, he was the voice Jarvis, of, and then he got actual yeah. screen time and he's probably pissed because he has to put all that fucking makeup on. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of changed the way that he initially entered into the into the film universe. But I mean, think about that, though, dude. think about Bettany and like what he's done. Like he was in Wimbledon, which was a relatively small love story or Kirsten Dunst. He was in. Knight's Tale, which was a very popular movie, but not nearly to the level as, you know, what he's doing now. And then he and then he's in literally the like one of the biggest movies of all time with uh, Infinity War. It goes right into Solo. And now he's part of both the Marvel and Star Wars yeah. universe. I'm also I don't, I don't know if you ever watched Master and Commander. I haven't that, seen it, but really I know that, that he's yeah. in that, too, with Russell Crowe. And uh, I think he got. Pippin from Lord of the Rings as like one of the only other movie roles he got after the Lord of the Rings, but he's in there. Yeah. And it was cool to see too, that, you know, he was the one who really wanted the role as, as Dryden. So he begged Ron. And then if we go back to last week, what we were talking about John Kasdan's tweets, like the, he specifically called out, it wasn't one of the tweets that we talked about, but he specifically called out saying that like, if you ever have the chance to work with Paul Bettany, do it immediately. So like this guy is obviously one of the, you know, one of the best people to work with in Hollywood, not only performance wise, but just personality wise. And that kind of came out in the round table uh, discussion that happened in the, in the behind the scenes. So that was really cool to see. Yeah, no, he's a pimp. I, I did. I mean, one thing that Bettany mentioned and, and I think Howard confirmed that Dryden's kind of chameleon scars, those were digital. And yeah, he didn't even have yeah. to wear a tracking mask. No, that's what he's, yeah, that was really impressive because he said, I didn't even know what my face looked like until you sent me a picture that you weren't supposed to send me. So, yeah, what Bettany said was they were able to just take his face as it is 
and even with all of the motion like essentially like you said track those marks into his face with no like tape no green screen work at all that's that's pretty fucking impressive like ILM though dude like ILM can do some crazy shit that nobody else right. can do so sticking with the round table feature at there, there are two other things that I, I found really interesting I mean really the whole conversation is interesting but it, it is just kind of casual talk I mean they're sitting around a, a, a sabak table just, just shooting the shit essentially I mean Ron Howard's playing the moderator just asking random questions uh, but there were two discussions or two points that were brought up that I thought were interesting that, that fans may uh, like to hear. And one revolved around the uh, Mimban pit fight between Chewie and Han. And they discussed how it was shot. But to me, the the crazy revelations were, A, that was a, a, a Chris and Phil deal entirely. And B, it took them three weeks to shoot that scene. Yeah, that's so, if, you know, going back to the shooting schedule and the reason why Chris and Phil were kicked off of this film, I see that as one of the primary reasons like that, that's one scene in the movie that takes up maybe five minutes and you took three weeks to shoot it. And we're talking about, you know, movie schedules that usually have, you know, maybe four, four to six months blocked out to shoot. and You take almost a full month shooting one scene. And that kind of lines up with what we heard about them and why they were removed is that they just kept doing take after take after take after take with no real direction, just kind of trying to see if the actors fell into what they were supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. And like it sounded like that's what happened here with this pit fighting scene. So it, it may sound cool, like, oh, my God, that scene took three weeks. But like no, that's I, if you think the- about <laughs> it from a logistics standpoint, that scene should not take three weeks to shoot. I mean... It no. requires a little bit of wires to fling Han around. It requires the set to be dressed and muddy as fuck. Same with the actors, but it, there's there's really no green screen shit, no CGI. I mean, they're not in some crazy location. I'm sure that was a, a, a studio set somewhere. Yeah. But three weeks <laughs> to shoot that. And we haven't talked about the deleted scenes yet, but w- when we get there, one of the ones I want to talk about was the extended um, pit fight. And when you watch that, you can see how it could take three weeks long because it drags the fuck on. Yeah, like it goes it goes way too long. And obviously, I don't think Ron was involved at all in the no, shooting that, that's, of that. It, did not, it sounded like it was a complete uh, Chris and Phil deal. Uh, and I'm sure Ron and, and Larry and whoever, the editors, helped pare it down. Yeah, yeah. So so what we got in the final cut was definitely the best version of what that could have been. But, I mean, and then if you listen to Jonas and, and Alden talk about that, especially Jonas, you know, having to be in this, essentially this muddied up Chewbacca suit, this Wookiee suit for three weeks. Um, and then also the physical exertion that was, that came along with that scene. If you've seen the movie, which I assume you have, like, you, you see all the things that Jonas is doing, like throwing all around the, the set and all this shit. And even though it's assisted by wires, like you still have to do some physical, you know, f- physical stunt work there. And that was all him. Like he earlier in the in the roundtable, he went through how he had like he was doing all of the stunts and him being a former athlete really helped him kind of get into that. Into well, yeah, that I mean, I know zone. we're not going to talk about it because we didn't find it that interesting, but the only kind of neat thing about the team chewy vignette is you get to see this big hulking dude i mean he's a tall athletic guy i mean he's not peter mayhew i mean he's well built i guess he played basketball something but he's in the wookie suit like doing some hardcore fucking like ninja rolls and box jumps and shit it was just funny seeing chewbacca like do uh physical training yeah, yeah, like it, one of the scenes that they showed, or one of the little snippets that they showed, like he he like goes into like a, a, a like a brace roll and comes out and fucking pulls yeah, out. Yeah, he looks like a badass. <laughs> where the Chewy we know yeah. in the OT, I mean, the guy just l- he, lumbers around. You know, it's like he he struggles to move just because Peter was really tall, but he wasn't athletically gifted like Eunice is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was really cool to see. But like we were saying. You know, th- that came out, and I think that, you know, the intention wasn't to, s- to like, poo-poo what Chris and Phil did by mentioning that it took three weeks to shoot. 
And like they were saying that as kind of a look how much work we put into this scene. But if you really read into it, like that is one of the primary reasons why that director switch happened. Like we were saying that that a scene like that shouldn't take that long to film. No, so, not at all. I mean, um, I, I know people who do like high octane car chases in a day or two. And yeah, that, there's so a lot of fucking moving parts there. I mean, you, you got to block off streets. You got to get all the, the, the cars staged up, hit your marks. I mean, come on. So, I mean, yeah, that, that exactly. that's why, you know, we both put on this list. It was just such a glaring like, oh, OK, well, there you go. There you go. Time is money. And the other big thing we got from this discussion, Nick, it kind of paid off on a tease from shit. I'd say a year, if not longer than a year ago, we we found out that on Ron's first day of shooting, George Lucas himself showed up on set just to kind of hang out and I guess give his former employee some some help, confidence building. Who knows? And, And we heard when George made a visit that he indirectly directed a scene uh, featuring Han, but uh, that's all we got. I mean, clearly they weren't going to tell us what was going on. We didn't know any plots at this point. We didn't even have trailers, nothing. I mean, th- this would have been June of 2017-ish. Uh, so during this roundtable discussion, th- that moment comes up, and they're showing some great footage. You know, Nick and I talked. Uh, seeing George on the, the, the Falcon set was, was something special. I mean, I, I wish they did a whole featurette just on George's visit. They do not. But they, they did talk about his visit and what that meant to Ron, and it was Ron nervous and yada, yada, yada. But what Ron ultimately reveals is what George told him. And if you remember the movie, there's a scene where Kieran and Han are in Lando's closet. She's looking at the capes. She hands one to Han to hang up, and he just kind of throws it behind him like a pimp. And he goes in, you know, he's trying to get close. Uh, apparently, initially in the script, Han was supposed to hang the cape back up by the hanger. But George saw that on the monitor and, and kind of, you know, in Ron's ear said, Han wouldn't do that. You know, Han Solo wouldn't hang that up. He'd just toss it aside. And, yeah. And there yeah, you go. Little... And, and, and the other important thing or point that Ron made, he's like, listen, Harrison Ford told me I did not create Han Solo. George Lucas did. So George Lucas, yeah. above anyone, is going to know how Han Solo is going to behave in a certain situation. Yeah, and that was really interesting to hear that. I mean, obviously Harrison wasn't in this this featurette, but hearing what he said, you know, George created Han, and I I brought what I could to right. the character, and now it's Alden's turn to do the same to to you know to embody what Han Solo is, but to also bring his own you know Alden's own sense of self to that character. And that's what was interesting from the very beginning about this movie is because everybody who thinks of Han Solo essentially just thinks of Harrison well, Ford. Well, we all do. And that's why I think it was such a revelation. I mean, even for me, I was like, you know what? He's fucking right. <laughs> I was like, in the end, these actors, they, they have no fucking saying on how this character behaves. I mean, they, they know how to bring the life based on what they are told. Yeah, I mean, the only instance where you have something like that is you know maybe later in filming you know when when Harrison is comfortable with the with the persona of Han he can like make suggestions but like really if you think like in the history of filmmaking the only person who can probably say like I know this character better than anybody is like Ethan Hunt being played by Tom Cruise like it's it there's there's very little that an an actor who embodies a character can say that they know about a character that a writer doesn't or like a creator like George Lucas does. It just so. it just brings up interesting speculation. Like uh, excuse me, what do you think George thought of Luke in TLJ? What's his thoughts on Luke? Cuz that's his character uh, after yeah. all. Is that what Luke would have done? I mean, if you really want to analyze it, I mean, technically yes, based on what Luke has done in the past, it's not what most of us want him to do, but if you look at how Luke has handled things and anytime he ran off, shit just got more fucked up. This time he's finally like, you know what? I'm better if I just fucking delete myself from this thread. Yeah. And I think that's kind of why he has removed himself from episodic speculation and then like saying, right. I mean, he you just, know, he what he thinks about those. I, I don't think he wants to taint the water any more than it's become. I mean, 
Yeah, exactly. Because anything he says is going to start a firestorm. Like, if he says that he would have played Luke Skywalker the exact same way, then you're going to have people on one side right. up in a fucking frenzy. And if he says he would have done it differently, he would have another people. Everybody I mean, else ultimately, up in a so it would be a great stamp of approval if he did come out and say something. If he did support the vision. I mean, that. I mean, at that point, a lot of these people that are saying, hey, hey my... Eat my Star Wars. Well, hey, man, the guy who fucking created it says it's what he would do. Well, what do you want now? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Disney paid him to say it. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to happen. No, he, it, and I'm, I'm glad that he's he kind of just stayed away from that shit and has mostly just said, oh, yeah, it was entertaining. You know, that those types yeah. of comments. He's settled into a role now that is more, you know, fan than creator. You know, like you said, when when this when Solo was being filmed by Chris and Phil, he didn't go on to the set and do you know all this stuff. No, it, it, it was only was when Ron, Ron yeah, took that was over. All Ron. Yeah, and it was and that wasn't because he wanted to see what was happening with the filming. That's because, like you said, like him and Ron had been friends, right? For, and for Kathleen, years, I mean, I think Kathleen probably said, "Hey, George, you know, we're at Ron's first day, man. What do we think about swinging by?" Yeah, you know. So it was cool to see that. You're right. It was. Whenever you see George Lucas back on the set of a Star Wars movie, uh, it's, it's a magical it, thing. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, to see it's 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 like if you were if you if you believe in a in a creator of the earth, if you yeah, were no, to see that dude, person see, just this walking is why, around. This is why we do podcasts together because I was just think I was like it was I was gonna say it's like seeing a god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it is. I mean. I don't know. I don't know. And I have like a lot of animosity against him for his decisions in the prequels. I I really do think he, he fucked his own franchise up with that shit, but he's still George ass Lucas. Yeah. And all this shit came from his fucking head. Yeah. I mean, he literally created, I mean, that's something that Alden said in the round table, like this, you know, star Wars was created fully and completely by George Lucas. So like, Seeing him on set is, yeah. you know, and is literally 40 li- plus him years living later. Him. People are still living in it, making tons of money off it. It's still, yeah, one of the most relevant franchises on the planet of any type of entertainment. Yeah, it's fucking so, crazy. Hey, awesome. Well, stuff. that's also why he got paid for Bill. Yeah, yeah. Dude, dude got <laughs> I'm pretty paid. Sure so, I mean, that was the round table. To me, that was the best of the what they call the featurettes uh just because of you had the main cast you had the director there's good conversation good questions and as we laid out a few revelations so nick let's just go ahead and keep going through the the featurettes now we're not going to talk about every single one so clearly the ones we leave out those are ones we're kind of like meh i mean i you should still watch them i mean it's it's behind the scenes of i would assume a movie from your favorite movie franchise so why not see how things came about but some of them just they don't really provide any deep insights and and that's kind of where i'm at these days i want insights i don't really care what it took to you know shoot the the train heist i mean that's all neat and i i, I like watching it but nothing really no, no good information came out of it so Let's start with one. There's one. It's called Kazdan on Kazdan, and it's about the father and son writing team of uh, Larry and John. And you just you got some cool insights into how the, the, the this father son writing team worked. And uh, what stood out to me, and I was kind of talking to Nick about it earlier, is the fact that John kept bringing up like, "Listen, I approach this universe, this story, thinking about." the entire work of Star Wars properties from, well, I'm assuming anything that, that's canon or maybe even old EU threads that he may have known. Uh, but John yeah. made it sound like he he takes this global view to the Star Wars franchise when writing new stories and trying to tie to as much as he can, be it prequels, be it some random EU thing they're bringing into canon, whatever. But he, he contrasted that to his father's way of thinking about how a scene should play out uh, because he said Larry still looks at the franchise from the scope of the original trilogy. 
Yeah, so we we know that Larry wasn't involved at all in the in the making of the prequel trilogy, and he did the bulk of his work in the original trilogy. So it makes sense that he's looking at it in a siloed kind of view. And you know, the the big thing that that John said is that he's the real Star Wars fan of the two of them, um, and I can see that because you know Larry was. You know, he's an older person now and he probably was never really like emotionally invested within the story of the Star Wars saga. But growing up within it like John did, like he, he mentions memories of like, you know, when, when Christmas time came around, they would get, you know, Star Wars toy care packages oh, dude, straight I mean, from that, Lucasfilm that right and stuff. Like, you fucker. Because you remember, I mean, this kid yeah, I know, that's essentially grew up in famous Hollywood. I mean. Exactly. So, you know, he, he grew up as a star Wars fan, whereas Larry always looked at star Wars as a job. So like you said, you know, John's fandom and and John's perspective on star Wars has extended way past what his father's did. Um, you know, Larry worked a little bit with JJ Abrams as in a consultant role for episode seven. He did no work on episode eight. We don't know if he has any sort of consult, you know, consultation role in episode nine, but yeah, his, I'm pretty sure Kazan came in and rewrote the script with Abrams, to be honest. Yeah, for, yeah. so it's he's probably done some work there as well. Um, but it is cool to see that John had this expansive view, like you said, bringing in, you know, specifically calling out uh, the EU. Well, you got, and, you got to think you know, then that, like you that. know, the reason we get Maul in the movie is probably, probably from John. an idea yeah, well, John had. I mean, uh, what, what was another callback they did in that? I mean, there was uh, tag and bake. They the, got cut, but you would think yeah. that's probably a John idea. I mean, hell, he played one of them, I believe, as an extra. Yeah, yeah. So, and then a lot of you know the inspiration behind the the pieces that were input into Dryden's lair probably came from from John as well, because um, there were some old EU. Um, possible old EU references in there and then obviously stuff that extends way beyond just the scope of the original trilogy so it was really cool to see like wh- what each person brought you know Larry brings Han Solo I mean like like you know people were saying you know the person well Kathleen Kennedy said nobody knows Han Solo better than Larry Kazdan other than maybe George Lucas so and to hear him talk in depth about you know Han Solo as he was in the original trilogy, and and then being able to tell a story that that gets you to that Han was really cool. Because I mean, f- say whatever you want about this movie, if you're not a fan of it, or if you're not a fan of how this portrayed Han in his younger years, like this comes from the guy himself. I mean, this co- there is no better source for Star Wars for original trilogy Star Wars material than Lawrence Kasdan. So like. If you don't agree with, you know, how he was portrayed, then, like, you're essentially saying that Larry Kasdan doesn't know anything about Han Solo. Um, so it was cool to see, like, his mindset behind it and, and how he went about taking the person that we saw in the beginning of the movie and then building him towards the person that is introduced in, in Mos Eisley Cantina in Episode 4. Um, really interesting to see all that play out. Yeah, so, I mean... <laughs> There, there's part of me watching this feature. I'm like, how lucky is this fucking family? But I, they, they did have some pretty cool insights into the production and, and just really what they are thinking about when they are crafting scenes. Uh, so I do think as a team they worked out because as we discussed, we got the balance of the old and the new. I, I do like these films pulling shit in from the, the animated series and the other canon-based properties in the Star Wars universe now. Uh, I'm all about that. I'm all about world building and lore and sh- making sure all this shit kind of carries through and strings everything together. I mean, it, it's yeah, it's ideal. Yeah. We we are... I know some people are pissed at Disney retcon the EU, but it, it was out of control. I mean, there, no... Uh, the, the, the caretaker, the maker, had no control over the stories going on. So you had fucking Chewie getting killed off. You had the Yuzan Bong coming in, almost wiping out the fucking Star Wars universe. It is getting kind of fucking squirrely, right? So yeah, you, yeah. sometimes <laughs> I mean, you have I- to rein shit in and have one overarching overseer that sets 
the the tone of the canon and make sure okay yeah this works this doesn't this is in this isn't yeah i mean as much as much as i love the old eu and the stories that were told there like you said it had gotten to a point to where if you were going to keep it if you were going to keep the old eu you basically would have had to just make movies off of the books like you would have you wouldn't have had anywhere to go and say like okay there's open time here so we can build something in here we'll have and then you have to stay loyal to the stories that are told because i mean there is a, a, a huge expanse of old eu material but it, it did okay in staying you know of keeping some continuity like you know you didn't have luke skywalker dying in one series and then alive in a different one that was happening at multiple times like it would have been too difficult for disney to come in and say like okay we own this property and we want to tell new stories but we have to do it within the bounds of the current expanded universe as it is already told so as much as it sucks that you lose stories like, you know, the the original Thrawn trilogy or um, the X-Wing uh, series of books or even going way back, you know, going into the, you know, the legacy of the Force series with, um, you know, Ben Skywalker and Jason and Jaina Solo, like you lose those, but you have so much room now to tell unique and interesting stories on the big screen and in novel form and in you know tv format it makes it made sense for for disney to do that and as we've seen already the the old eu is not necessarily dead they're still pulling things in but it, it was a necessary sacrifice i guess you would say yeah and when it comes down to it i literally did not get into the eu or dive into it like some people because I knew it wasn't canon. I, I am that type of guy. I'm that type of fan. I know, hey, in the end, all this shit's fucking fake, right, Nick? It's all made up bullshit. Don't get yeah. us wrong. <laughs> I'm not that delusional, okay? I get it. But I also enjoy sci-fi fantasy worlds that aren't here because who the fuck wants to read stories about real life? I mean, just just turn on the fucking news or go outside. Real life sucks dick. That's why we watch this yeah. type of shit, okay? So, exactly. it, But to me... If something's not canon, it's not real. And that's why I, I could never really buy into the EU. The old EU. Yeah, there the, yeah, there was definitely like... It, it got to a point where things were getting muddled, things were getting weird, because you had so many overlapping I mean, you know, this, points. This and then, sibling, like, that sibling, this twin, that kid, this Ben, that solo. Yeah, it's like, what the fuck? Yeah, so... I mean, and the way that they're doing the EU now is a lot better. I mean, like, there's, you know, a solid vetting process. And even though there was, like, a vetting process that was in the old EU, it did kind of get a little out of control. But, you know, the stories that are being told now in the Expanded Universe novels are fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm reading through the, the first Thrawn book right now. Really fucking good. I have the second Thrawn book already. I mean, there's a ton of comic book threads out there. Um, I know you're a huge fan of the Vader. Yeah, and um, I need to get my ass comic series. caught up because I, I don't read comics regularly. Like, I don't wait every Wednesday for the new one to come out each month. I kind of let them build up until they're in volumes, and I can buy the volume usually for cheap. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, the comics have been fucking fantastic. But the reason I read comics now when I have time is because they're canon. Yeah, like, those stories are, you know true true life real star wars stories so yeah so all right uh, well i'll get off yeah it's pretty good so, so that's kazan and kazan i mean there, there's a few others uh, another featurette that kind of stood out to nick and i there there's a whole behind the scenes on the speeder chase on Corellia. and the reason nick that it stood out to me is that it revealed that a lot of that chase scene was shot practically meaning they were literally driving those fucking speeders around a set and and they were really drifting and you know they they just kind of used the the vfx and the cgi to essentially clean it all up and and you know wipe the the tires off the the, the speeders and make it look like they're hovering for the most part yeah, it's super impressive to see that because when you, I mean, generally when you look at a, a sci-fi movie like that and they're driving these hover cars or speeders or anything like that, you assume it's all CG and that they're just using the tight shots to show, 
you know, the, your two main characters in a, in a studio that are, you know, sitting behind a, a, a stationary set. But in this one, like you said, all that driving was real. So when you see these, these speeders drifting through the streets of Corellia and, you know, bumping into shit and making these jumps, like these small jumps, like that actually happened. And that's why that scene looks so good. Like it doesn't look fake because it wasn't fake. Like you said, all they did was essentially they had the the models of the speeders, you know, Han's speeder that he stole and then Moloch's giant truck-like speeder. They just had them on wheels, and then once it was all done, they just took the wheels out with CG, touched up some things here and there, and then inter, you know, interworked, you know, some CG scenes into the practical driving scene and, you know, it put together a, a really fantastic speeder chase throughout the you know through the city of Corellia and so much so that like during the documentary they said they couldn't even build a set that was big enough to to encompass this because they were they were driving too much so they were doing this on like real streets and, and um you know again why you that scene looks so fantastic it's because it was done on a real street with real it, it almost looked like and, uh, Alden was driving for a good part of it yeah, I think outside of like the super dangerous shit where he's like where he has to do like a big drift or he's like jumping off something really huge, like he was actually behind the wheel, like him and and um, yeah, Amelia yeah, Clark and these were weren't like vehicle. on rigs either, because I mean a lot of times when you're watching a car scene and characters are talking, I mean hopefully you know they're not driving. Uh, usually the car is on like a flatbed. It's just being pulled or sometimes they're just in a fucking studio with screens making it look like shit's going behind them. Right. OK. So hopefully yeah, everyone's yeah. OK with movie magic. Uh, but these motherfuckers, I mean, they didn't even have like a camera rig built on the front of the fucking car. I mean, they were just like driving and, and shooting. I mean, it was like a real deal car chase filmed in a sci fi universe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the people who did this stunt driving are super talented. I mean, if you if you can if you haven't watched the behind the scenes yet, but if you can remember in your head like that one part of the chase where the two cars are chasing each other and then do like a drift loop and then come back around onto a different street, like they had, like those drivers actually did that. Like that was a real motion that they went through, choreographed with two stunt drivers. I mean, the work that those that those guys put in was really fantastic. And then also, you know, included in the behind the scenes, you got you, not only do you get to see the speeder chase itself, but then, you know, how they design these vehicles and what decisions they made on designing these these vehicles to make them, you know, stand out stylistically. And then also, you know, essentially use them to set each other off. So you have Han's sleek looking kind of muscle car style of speeder and then this hulking giant truck vehicle that Moloch was driving and they they go into the decisions made um there and why they made the you know the two vehicles look the way they did a lot of good information uh there if you're into like you know vehicle design and and the creative decisions made uh for some of the the set dressing and stuff like that it's really really interesting to watch yeah, so that was a good one. And then just rounding out the featurettes, ones that had some, some pretty good reveals in there. There, there. There's one on Phoebe, was it Waller-Cates? Phoebe Waller-Bridge, yeah. There you yeah. Go. Same thing. Uh, <laughs> and how she, uh, you know, obviously brought L3 to life. And uh, there are two interesting things about this featurette. The first was just the costume she had to wear, which was essentially the the shell of L3 and then anywhere L3 had open parts where you could you know see her wires and whatnot uh, Phoebe was wearing a either a green spandex blue spandex whatever she even had the fucking helmet and everything and, and really the the VFX artist said that because of her suit and how she was set up they were essentially able to map all of her motions to the L3 wireframe obviously in the computer system, which is why L3, if you, if you notice, I noticed it the first time I watch it, specifically the scene where they're uh, at the lodge, they're picking up the Falcon, and she's walking in front of everyone. I mean, I was like, I was like damn, L3 struts like a hot-ass woman. And that's <laughs> exactly what happened. I mean, that's literally Phoebe walking 
they just used, you know, her green screen suit and she wasn't even really wearing those balls and shit. And they, they so they essentially just subbed out the spandex she was wearing and put in all the wires and pistons and this, that and the other thing. So it was cool. I mean, it, it wasn't like the full on Anthony Daniels C-3PO suit, which is 100 percent practical. Uh, but it was not just the good old CGI testicle suit. You know, the gray suit with yeah. the gray helmet and all the balls all over the place either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was a good mix of both. And, I mean, this one was really fun because Phoebe is a really cool person to kind of get in her head and listen to how she developed the character of L3. Because it seems like, you know, they had L3 ca- L3's character written out, but really Phoebe was able to bring this to life with her own like the exuberance that she brought to the character and the just like the the spark of life that she gave to a droid which we haven't really seen in the Star Wars universe before the closest that we've gotten so far to what uh L3 is was K2 in Rogue oh, yeah, One without a doubt uh, but it was to, yeah so so seeing how these new actors Alan Tudyk with K2 and then Phoebe with well, L3, I mean, technically, I think if we knew what R2 is saying, he's the original yeah. personality. Yeah. Yeah, so that's – and I'm pretty sure this may be something – like, I'll bring this up a little bit later. But maybe, you know, Anthony Daniels had an idea of what R2 was saying based off of what we learned about Alden's reaction – or Alden's interaction. Oh, yeah, they, with they did mention that all of Chewie's lines are legitimate dialogue. Yeah, yeah, so it's – Within the script, right. you know, there so that, that's is why Alden's it always lines sounded, reading. You know, when the when the other actors respond to him as if they know what he's saying. Well, that's why. Yeah, exactly. It's written on the paper, even though it's not. And, and it makes so, complete sense. So, yeah. the other thing, the Al three feature at Nick that was an interesting nugget. I mean, we, we do learn by the end of the movie that L three becomes one with the Millennium Falcon because of her her nav computer. And yeah. if so. you've ever heard the nav computer when they're punching it up to go in the hyperspace, we now know that the reason it sounds that way is because that's how L3 sounded when she was calculating a destination. And, and you actually get to see that in Solo. You probably weren't paying attention. But when, you know, when her and Lando are getting ready to take off, he's like, essentially, are you ready? And she goes like, blah, blah, blah. And you can hear it go like, blah, blah, blah. She gets the coordinates in, and then they rock and roll. You know, they do the fist bump, and here we go. Let's get the hyperdrive and, and locked and loaded. Yeah, yeah, that was really cool. The only other thing that I would want to call out from that is the fact that they said that L three started off as a regular astromech droid, and she, and essentially, you know, the the lore behind L three is that she is a sentient. You oh know, yeah, I, I mean they they really brought that up before. Where she's essentially she looks the way she does because she made herself that way. Yeah, she she built her own legs yeah, and attached them. She's just them been and jacking she, like, parts and, and constructing yeah. herself. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's so that character in itself. I mean, obviously there is a, you know, there is a social undertone, not even an undertone, but there is a social pinning to that character, and you know, obvi- you know, leading a droid revolution on Kessel, and all of all of what she stands for as a droid in Star Wars is mirrored to you know, women in society nowadays, and it, which I think is really fucking cool. But, um, I mean, just the way that that character is portrayed in the movie by Phoebe and the way that it was written and the way that it was executed, I mean, just such a fantastic job by the writers, directors, everybody involved with the creation and execution of Yeah, L3. so just a random Star Wars tidbit here. It just popped up on my Twitter feed from Death Star PR. When faced with a difficult problem, run away and hide in a cave, swamp, or on a remote island until someone younger comes along to fix it for you. Ancient <laughs> Jedi problem. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's See? pretty accurate. A lot of people pretty forget accurate. that. I mean, I, I'll, I like to bring that up. I was like, well, what the fuck did Obi-Wan and Yoda do, you motherfuckers? They did yeah, the same Yoda shit that Luke like, did, ah. so shut the fuck up. All right, yeah. so Yoda, Yoda that that kind of sums up the featurettes. We have a few of the deleted scenes that we considered good. One we've already talked about. We don't need to. That's the extended fight. We didn't really think it was good. We thought it was. It, it kind of highlighted the the nugget that was brought up in the round table that took three weeks to shoot. Because if you watch the extended fight scene, I mean, there's times where you're like, okay, I'm ready for this to end. It loses a lot of the charm and humor, the way it was yeah, uh, originally it- shot. So. 
there was literally a part within the extended scene where Chewie just goes and sits down yeah, yeah, for like yeah, they're just 10 like seconds. hanging out <laughs> as they're planning out. Like the whole plan actually plays out a lot longer in the extended part in terms of like them working together. You know, they actually yeah, and, they, they he sits down because he feels like they can't break the pole. Yeah, because yeah. at first Chewie they're just like he's just like up. hitting him into it. And then they sit down, and he's like, no, 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 you know, dive at it, blah, 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 and they eventually figure it out. So, anyways, the really good deleted scenes in our, our last episode of Star Wars Time, which should be, is out now, I just put it out today. Uh, obviously, it'll be out when you're listening to this, but we already talked about probably the best deleted scene, and it should not have been removed whatsoever, and that was Han's trial with the Empire to get kicked out of the Navy to the ground troops, so we're not going to cover that. But there are two others I want to talk about real quickly. And the, uh, the one deals with the street chase. But instead of it just being purely speeder-based, at one point in time, there was also going to be a, a foot race that we saw. And it was actually a pretty good scene with Han and Kira and, and how they ditched Moloch at first. And they essentially jump into the street vendor's eel pot, and it's super disgusting but Han still starts to feel a little funny in his pants and tries to make a move until he realizes that the reason he feels funny in his pants is because there's an eel down there chewing on his yeah. dingling. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, you know, there's a subtle callback to episode four in that when they're in the trash pit and Luke feels something rubbing against his leg and it ends up being the fucking trash monster that we see. But it is like it's a cool scene and it shows you the growth of Han Solo between that time when the youngest that we've ever seen him to the person he is when he's like hitting on Leia in the, you know, in the Falcon in episode five and they're trying to fix shit. I mean, there is a huge difference between those two because within that scene, within that deleted scene, like Han and, and Kira are talking. They're obviously in this, you know, distressing situation trying to get away from Moloch. But then like Han still goes in, like tries to lean in for a kiss. And Kira's like, what are you doing? Like not, this is not the time for this. So you see a completely different version of Han than you've ever seen before. There's still like this, this like the soft exterior. Right. He, he's of not Han as brash not or, or yet. calloused yeah. at this point. Exactly. He's so that like was a really puppy cool. dog with her. Yeah, I mean, he was his genuine, you know, wear your emotions on your sleeve self when he was with Kira as a, you know, as a young, and that's why, I mean, not even we talked about in our last episode, John said that, listen, these two characters have a three part act and we've only seen two parts. Yeah. So there's, there's still stories to be told. I would love to to see how that relationship resolves. Who knows? Uh, Maybe at the positive buzz around Solo's home release keeps going and Disney makes another 200 million on fucking home sales, which I doubt it. Uh, but y- y- you never know. You know, maybe you know time heals all wounds, right? So yeah. the other good deleted scene that got cut—that uh, makes no sense. If it's a deleted scene, it was cut. So the other good scene that was deleted. There you go. I'm all over the place. Was uh, <laughs> uh, an extended look at the uh, Minbam battle, and it, it showed more of what happened after. You know, Beckett leads that charge because in the finished movie, it's essentially Beckett's like, all right, let's go. Ah, and then they're right back to after the battle they won. I mean, there was like a whole battle that played out for, you know, two, three minutes. Right. I mean, you got to see some yeah. firefights. You got to see Han shoot and you got to see Beckett pull out his pistols and do some shooting. Rio but jumping around. More importantly, yeah. you get to see the uh, fourth member of Beckett's original crew get shot up and he was considered their heavy. And we learned last week that. Uh, that was all going to be in there because they wanted the audience to know like, okay, Beckett's team lost a heavy. They lost a pilot. So kind of, you know, put two and two together. Chewie's the heavy, Han's the pilot, blah, blah, blah. And they decided to cut it. But I I just thought the scene in general, not even accounting for the fact that you see a member of Beckett's crew get killed. I I just liked the extra action. Yeah. I liked the extra action. I also liked, you know what that gave to Beckett's character because like you said in the in the original cut or in the you know final cut you you get to see Beckett in that you know in that circumstance but in this extended cut you get to see him as a true leader like he's not just it's not quick and you get to see him like lead people lead Han through this situation 
and then also essentially has control of an entire imperial unit. <laughs> as a, as fights a smuggler. As, yeah, as a smuggler, fights them through this battle and then, you know, saves enough to get back to the imperial encampment and out of the out of harm's way. And like you said, he loses a member along the way. So you get to see him and Val and Rio kind of, you know, take a, a moment, even if it was just that, to, to mourn this person's death and then move on. Um, I thought it was, yeah, I thought that scene was, was pretty good. Um, I understand why they cut it just for pacing reasons, um, but I do think that it, it does add a little bit of character um, and, and, and context to, to Beckett. In, in the film, yeah, so I did. I really think cool. the only deleted scene that was a, a an egregious omission was the Hans trial. I, I just, yeah, I mean, it was so perfect, Han, and the way it cuts right to him getting blown up in the air. I mean, it, it was fantastic. I, I just, I don't, I don't get that one. But oh well, that's why we talk about it, and we're not the ones in the editing room doing it. Yep, exactly. All right, people. Well, I mean, that, you know, we, we kept it quick. And you know what? This is the first time in a long time we've kept the Star Wars time under an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and give us both a fucking medal. Yeah, we did pretty good this time. I mean, not a lot of content to talk about, but we don't want to spoil everything in the featurettes for you right. guys. Like we said, there's an hour and Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of content to go content. through. We didn't talk about not even half of it. Yeah, so... If you're taking one thing from this, like there's good stuff in there. Even the parts that we didn't talk about are really good. There's a lot of Donald Glover talking about his, you know, the the Falcon talking about Lando. Um, you obviously have Alden in there talking about his experiences as Han. Um, everybody who plays a main part in this movie gets to talk about their experience and what they did to bring these characters to life. So uh, do yourself a favor, and if you own the, you know. If, one, if you haven't bought the digital yet, don't wait for the physical. Digital is fantastic. It's 4K UHD HDR on, on Vudu. Go get it right now. Um, and if you're waiting for the you know the physical release, then make sure to get the one with all the featurettes in it because it's really cool, really good context behind everything that was in the movie. Yeah, so, it's legit. Good stuff. It's a good package. Pick it up out now on all uh, streaming platforms. The physical, I think, is another week or two away. As Nick said, 25th, it's not really worth yeah. waiting for, but... Uh, it's okay. I get it. It took me 37 years of my life to get over feeling like I need to own physical discs of Blu-rays. And ever since I did, life's just been better. I mean, money isn't physical right. anymore. Why I should mean, movies, movies <laughs> the arrival of movies anywhere pretty much makes it a no-brainer to only get digital because yeah. your library is mostly synced now. There's only a few commie studios that don't participate Meaning if I buy something on iTunes or even if I already had something in iTunes, it's now going to show up in Vudu, Fandango Now, Amazon, and vice versa. I mean, it's fantastic. So get on that digital train. Plus, you get shit earlier. I mean, they're just, as we said last, I think last week we talked about this again. They just, they make it too enticing not to get the digital at this point. Yeah, they're pushing you towards it because they have an overhead when they make physical discs, people. Like, even if it's, you know, cents on the dollar to make them, they still have to pay something. With a digital release, all they do, it's a file uploaded to a computer yep. server. They just and have to have the, the bandwidth. That's about it. Yep. So, switch over. All right, people. Well, um, we're recording this one early. Not that you would know. We're kind of breaking the fourth wall here. So, there's a good chance we're going to have uh, some news that builds up at the end of this week going into next week. So, next cast, you never know. I'm hoping for some Episode Nine stuff, like concrete stuff. We haven't had any since the first round of leaks. So, I'm hoping some, some shit comes out. Maybe some more of the Black Rock set. Who knows? But I, I, I'm craving for some Episode Nine speculation. That whole Captain Marvel reveal this week got me ready to, to pick through stuff and speculate because that's what I like to do the best. All right, my 100%. friends. Until then, may the Force be with you always. Always.